wanted to start um, by introducing you to uh, Judith Conway, John's niece, um, who is going to provide us with a little bit of insight into um, John's family life. So please welcome Judith. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. John Davis Evans was born on the 22nd of January, 1925, in the Toxteth district of Liverpool, the only child of Harry and Edith. Harry is on the right-hand side of that row, if you look at that picture. John's grandfather was a blacksmith and was Welsh-speaking, but the learning of Welsh was discouraged by John's grandparents and parents. John always wanted to learn the language, and when his wife Evelyn became too ill to be left on her own, he finally had the time to teach himself. He did this to a level which enabled him to read serious literature in Welsh, but he said he lacked the conversation practice to speak it well. John's ability to learn languages was incredible. He spoke French and Spanish fluently, and learnt German, Arabic and Greek, among others, but told us that he could never get to grips with Cantonese. John was named after John Davis, who was a successful seafarer in the 1860s on his mother's side of the family. His father worked in the offices of the Elder Dempster shipping line, and the family moved out to the new suburbs in the 1930s. John won a scholarship to the Liverpool Institute in 1936 and sometimes recalled the long bus journey he had to make to get to school. Harry and Edith were devout Methodists and Harry was a lay preacher. While John was brought up in the religion, he did not follow it in adult life but remained an agnostic. John was a school prefect, was always studious and loved to read. His cousin told us that his mother used to complain that when the Evanses came to tea, John would sit down, open a book and start reading. His manners as a visitor improved in later life, but certainly whenever we stayed with him, he would always have a book beside him and dip into it in moments when he was on his own. John went to Cambridge in 1942 when he was 17. He studied English for a year before being recruited for code breaking at Bletchley Park to work on the German codes. John found it exciting work, but when the war in Europe ended, he was transferred to the Japanese codes, which was much slower work and not nearly as exciting. When war ended, John was told that he had been at Bletchley Park as a civilian and he had to do two years military service. He was sent to Singapore, still working on code breaking. He was furious to lose a further two years in this way. And even when he talked about this at the end of his life, he was still furious about it. John signed the Official Secrets Act. And when people started to publish their memoirs about Bletchley, he felt that they were wrong to do so. However, when my mother brought him one of those books for Christmas one year, he went back to his childhood habit and sat in a corner of the room, reading continuously, occasionally guffawing with laughter or reading short extracts to the assembled company. While John never spoke much about that time, he did come to believe that the Bletchley story was one that should be told. John graduated with a star first in archaeology in 1948 and completed his MA in 1950. He then went to Spain to study for his PhD and it was there that he developed a lifelong taste for Sherry and Rioja. Each year when our annual skiing holiday was impending, John would tell us how his love of Rioja came about. He was persuaded by a friend to try his hand at skiing and was fitted out with a pair of boots which were borrowed from somewhere. As some of you will know, John was a tall man and his foot size was proportionately large. The boots were far too small. The trip involved a long walk to the ski slope and by the time they arrived, John was already suffering. 
John would be the first to admit that hand-eye coordination was not his strong suit, and he found skiing completely impossible. Worse still, the walk back remained to be undertaken. Luckily, along the way, they passed a cottage where they asked an old lady if she would sell them a drink. She brought out two glasses and a jug of Rioja. John thought it was the best drink he had ever had, and it remained his favourite wine until the end of his life. John eventually found a subject for his PhD in Malta and worked there until he returned to Cambridge as a research fellow in 1954. It was during this period that he met my mother's younger sister, Evelyn Slavin. Evelyn grew up in Lincoln and was interested in the archaeological digs that went on in the city. She left school at 16 and trained as a librarian. She worked in Lincoln and then moved to Shrewsbury, where she was involved in various digs and other historical research. In 1954, she was accepted by Cambridge to study archaeology. Although two years her junior, John was her tutor. A friend of Evelyn's wrote that she watched the growing romance between Evelyn and her shy tutor with fascination. The pair were married in 1957, as soon as Evelyn graduated, and just after John took up his chair at the Institute. John was very pleased that Kathleen Kenyon, who it seems knew both of them, told him that she thought he had made a good choice. It's hard to imagine that John was ever shy, even as a young man. He was always a great talker. He was genuinely interested in the people he met, and he could always recount the family history and derivation of the name of anyone he told us about. Evelyn complained about him attending formal dinners and immediately engaging with convers in conversation with those around him and paying no attention to whether he was using the correct cutlery for the course. This remained the case, and latterly at Shaftesbury, although he loved to have the table properly set for dinner, and engage in discussion about all manner of subjects over a glass or two of Rioja, he always ended up eating with the serving implements. On one occasion, in the days of the Cold War, they were driving across Eastern Europe to Istanbul. When they got to the Iron Curtain, they found that they had forgotten their visas. Nonetheless, John managed to talk the border guards into letting them through and they managed to get all the way to Istanbul and back. John and Evelyn set up home initially in Torrington Square and later moved to Swiss Cottage. In the late 1960s, John and Evelyn rented a cottage near Stockton in Wiltshire. John did not really like London and they both loved to get away to the country. Highgrove Cottage was along a farm track some distance from a tarmac road. They spent many happy weekends, as well as Christmas and Easter breaks there, and enjoyed making it a home and creating the garden from scratch. John and Evelyn loved to walk in the Wiltshire countryside, and I think they both found it a truly relaxing retreat, despite a continual battle with mice inside and rabbits and pheasants in the garden. Evelyn worked alongside John throughout his career. She was always reticent and quiet, but she was very practical. John always appeared to us as a family to be the archetypal absent-minded professor. And I think it was she who often dealt with many of the practicalities of life. She apparently spotted and arranged to buy a Land Rover for the Institute to take abroad as the then director would not allow the vehicle the organisation owned to be taken out of the country. John and Evelyn retired to Shaftesbury and continued to walk in the, in the hills of Wiltshire and Dorset. The last of three properties they owned in the town was Melbury Cottage, which afforded lovely views across the valley to Melbury Hill. At that stage, John taught himself to use a computer a skill some would say he never fully mastered. He also continued to be involved with many of the organisations he worked with while at the Institute. 
Initially, he attended meetings in London, particularly this society, and he followed its affairs right up until his death. John and Evelyn also travelled abroad to conferences, and he lectured as well. It was in the late 1990s that Evelyn started to suffer from Alzheimer's, and John became increasingly tied to looking after her. Knowing what was happening, she taught him to cook, and he turned his intellect to working out how to do some of the practical things he had never had to do before. John was a truly devoted husband, and when Evelyn had to go into a nursing home, John visited her every day. John was soon recruited to the board of trustees of the nursing home and took a keen interest in its administration and activities. When a new member of staff started there, he was asked if she could lodge with him for a few nights each week. Thus Stella joined John at Melbury Cottage. She was Nigerian and cooked African meals for him, which he loved. John was a very modest man. When asked about his success at school or throughout his career, he would always say he had been lucky and talk about various people who had helped him along the way. In some respects, he may have been lucky, but he seemed to me to be an extraordinarily clear and logical thinker. He also had an inquiring mind and an incredible memory. He was always polite, but he was quietly determined. He certainly got frustrated, but was far too much a gentleman to let it boil into anger. John was very fit until about two years before his death. Then he battled hard with the constraints his illness put on him, always determined to get out and about in Shaftesbury and keep involved with archaeology, the home and the people around him. It was his wish that his and Evelyn's ashes be scattered on Melbury Hill and in their memory we're having a seat placed on Park Walk in Shaftesbury looking out at the hill and the view they so loved. Thank you.